Chapter 13 If you ride northward, the length of Manhattan Island, going through Central Park, and coming out of 7th Avenue or Lenox Avenue at 110th Street, you cannot escape being struck by the sudden change in the character of the people you see. In the middle and lower parts of the city, you have perhaps noted Negro faces here and there, but when you emerge from the park, you see them everywhere. And as you go up either of these two great arteries leading out from the city to the north, you see more and more Negroes. Walking in the streets, looking from the windows, trading in the shops, eating in the restaurants, going in and coming out of the theaters, until, nearing 135th Street, 90% of the people you see, including the traffic officers, are Negroes. And it is not until you cross the Harlem River that the population whitens again, which it does as suddenly as it began to darken at 110th Street. You have been having an outside glimpse of Harlem, the Negro metropolis. In nearly every city in the country, the Negro section is a nest or several nests situated somewhere on the borders. It is a section one must, quote, go out to. In New York, it is entirely different. Negro Harlem is situated in the heart of Manhattan and covers one of the most beautiful and healthful sites in the whole city. It is not a fringe. It is not a slum. Nor is it a, quote, unquote, quarter consisting of dilapidated tenements. It is a section of new law apartment houses and handsome dwellings, with streets as well paved, as well lighted, and as well kept as in any other part of the city. Three main highways lead into and out from Upper Manhattan, and two of them run straight through Harlem. So Harlem is not a section that one quote-unquote goes out to, but a section that one goes through. Roughly drawn, the boundaries of Harlem are 110th Street on the south, on the east, Lenox Avenue to 126th Street, then Lexington Avenue to the Harlem River, and the Harlem River on the east and north to a point where it passes the Polo Grounds, just above 155th Street. On the west, 8th Avenue to 116th Street, then St. Nicholas Avenue up to a juncture with the Harlem River at the Polo Grounds. To the east of the Lenox Avenue boundary, there are a score of blocks of mixed colored and white population, and to the west of the 8th Avenue boundary, there is a solid Negro border, two blocks wide, from 116th Street to 125th Street. The Heights, north from 145th Street, known as Coogan's Bluff, are solidly black. Within this area of less than two square miles live more than 200,000 Negroes, more to the square acre than in any other place on earth. This city within a city, in these larger proportions, is actually a development of the last 15 years. The trek to Harlem began when the West 53rd Street Center had reached its utmost development, that is, early in the decade, 1900 to 1910. The move to West 53rd Street had been the result of the opportunity to get into better houses, and the move to Harlem was due to the same urge. In fact, Harlem offered the colored people the first chance in their entire history in New York to live in modern apartment houses. West 53rd Street was superior to anything they had ever enjoyed, and there they were, for the most part, making private dwellings serve the purpose of apartments, housing several families in each house. The move to Harlem in the beginning, and for a long time, was fathered and engineered by Philip A. Payton, a colored man in the real estate business. But this was more than a matter of mere business with Mr. Payton. 
the matter of better and still better housing for colored people in New York became the dominating idea of his life and he worked on it as long as he lived when Negro New Yorkers evaluate their benefactors in their own race they must find that not many have done more than Phil Payton for much of what has made Harlem the intellectual and artistic capital of the Negro world is in good part due to this fundamental advantage Harlem has provided New York Negroes with better cleaner more modern more airy more sunny houses than they ever lived in before and this is due to the efforts made first by Mr. Payton. Harlem had been overbuilt with new apartment houses. It was far uptown, and the only rapid transportation was the elevated running up 8th Avenue. The Lenox Avenue subway had not yet been built. This left the people on Lenox Avenue and to the east with only the electric streetcars convenient so landlords were finding it hard to fill their houses on that side of the section. Mr. Payton approached several of these landlords with the proposal to fill their empty houses with colored tenants and keep them filled. Economic necessity usually discounts race prejudice or any other kind of prejudice as much as 99%, sometimes 100 so the landlords with empty houses whom Mr. Payton approached accepted his proposal and one or two houses on 134th Street were taken over and filled with colored tenants. Gradually other houses were filled. The white residents of the section showed very little concern about the movement until it began to spread to the west and across Lenox Avenue. Then they took steps to check it. They organized and formed plans to purchase through the Hudson Realty Company a financial concern, all properties occupied by colored people and evict the tenants. Payton countered by forming the Afro-American Realty Company, a Negro corporation organized for the purpose of buying and leasing houses to be let to colored tenants. This counterstroke held the opposition in check for several years and enabled the Negroes to hold their own. But the steady and increasing pressure of Negroes across the Lenox Avenue deadline caused the opposition to break out anew, and this time the plans were more deeply laid and more difficult for the Negroes to defeat. These plans, formulated by several leading spirits, involved what was actually a conspiracy the organization of whites to bring pressure on financial institutions to lend no money and renew no mortgages on properties occupied by colored people. These plans had considerable success and reached beyond the situation they were formed to deal with. They still furnish one of the hardest and most unjustifiable handicaps the Negro property owner in Harlem has to contend with. The Afro-American Realty Company, for lack of the large amount of capital essential, was now defunct. But several individual colored men carried on. Philip A. Payton and J.C. Thomas bought two five-story apartments. Dispossessed the white tenants and put in colored ones. John B. Nail bought a row of five apartments and did the same. St. Philip's Episcopal Church one of the oldest and richest colored congregations in New York bought a row of 13 apartments on 135th Street between Lenox and 7th Avenues and rented them to colored tenants. The situation now resolved itself into an actual contest, but the Negro pressure continued constant. Colored people not only continued to move into apartments outside the zone east of Lenox Avenue, but began to purchase the fine private houses between Lenox and 7th. Then in the eyes of the whites who were antagonistic, the whole movement took on the aspect of an quote-unquote invasion, an invasion of both their economic and their social rights. They felt that Negroes as neighbors not only lowered the values of their property, but also lowered their social status. 
Seeing that they could not stop the movement, they began to flee. They took fright. They became panic-stricken. They ran amok. Their conduct could be compared to that of a community in the Middle Ages, fleeing before an epidemic of the Black Plague, except for the fact that here the reasons were not so sound. But these people did not stop to reason. They did not stop to ask why they did what they were doing, or what would happen if they didn't do it. The presence of a single colored family in a block, regardless of the fact that they might be well-bred people with sufficient means to buy their home, was a signal for precipitate flight. The stampeded whites actually deserted house after house and block after block. Then prices dropped. They dropped lower than the bottom and such colored people as were able took advantage of these prices and bought. Some of the banks and lending companies that were compelled to take over deserted houses for the mortgages they held refused for a time to either sell or rent them to Negroes. Instead they proposed themselves to bear the carrying charges and hold them vacant for what they evidently hoped would be a temporary period. Prices continued to drop and this was the property situation in Harlem at the outbreak of the World War in Europe. With the outbreak of the war there came a sudden change. One of the first effects of the war was to draw thousands of aliens out of this country back to their native lands to join the colors. Naturally there was also an almost total cessation of immigration. Moreover, the United States was almost immediately called upon to furnish munitions and supplies of all kinds to the warring countries. The result of these converging causes was an unprecedented shortage of labor and a demand that was imperative. From whence could the necessary supply be drawn? There was only one source, and that was the reservoir of black labor in the South and it was at once drawn on to fill the existing vacuum in the great industries of the North. Every available method was used to get these black hands, the most effective being the sending of labor agents into the South, who dealt directly with the Negroes, arranged for their transportation, and shipped them North, often in single consignments running high up into the hundreds. I witnessed the sending north from a southern city in one day, a crowd estimated at 2,500. They were shipped on a train, run in three sections, packed in day coaches, with all their baggage and other impedimenta. The exodus was on, and migrants came north in thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, from the docks of Norfolk, Savannah, Jacksonville, Tampa, Mobile, New Orleans, and Galveston, from the cotton fields of Mississippi and the coal mines and steel mills of Alabama and Tennessee, from workshops and wash tubs and brickyards and kitchens they came, until the number, by conservative estimate, went well over the million and a half mark. For the Negroes of the South, this was the happy blending of desire with opportunity. It could not be otherwise in such a wholesale migration than that many who came were ignorant, inefficient, and worthless, and that there was also a proportion of downright criminals, but industry was in no position to be fastidious. It was glad to take what it could get. It was not until the return of more normal conditions that the process of elimination of the incapable and the unfit set in. Meanwhile, in these new fields, the Negro was acquiring all sorts of divergent reputations for capability. In some places he was rated A number one, and in others NG, and in varying degrees between these two extremes. The explanation, of course, is that different places had secured different kinds of Negroes. On the whole, New York was more fortunate in the migrants she got than were some of the large cities. Most of the industries in the manufacturing cities of the Middle West, except the steel mills, which drew largely on the skilled and semi-skilled labor from the mills of Alabama and Tennessee, received migrants from the cotton-raising regions of the lower Mississippi Valley, from the rural, 
even the backwoods districts, Negroes who were unused to city life or anything bearing a resemblance to modern industry. On the other hand, New York drew most of her migrants from cities and towns of the Atlantic seaboard states. Negroes who were far better prepared to adapt themselves to life and industry in a great city. Nor did all of New York's Negro migrants come from the South. The opportunity for Negro labor exerted a pull that reached down to the Negroes of the West Indies, and many of them came, most of them directly to New York. Those from the British West Indies average high in intelligence and efficiency. There is practically no illiteracy among them, and many have a sound English common school education. They are characteristically sober-minded and have something of a genius for business, differing almost totally in these respects from the average rural Negro of the South. Those from the British possessions constitute the great majority of the West Indians in New York, but there is also a large number who are Spanish-speaking and a considerable though smaller number who are French speaking. The total West Indian population of Harlem is approximately 50,000. With thousands of Negroes pouring into Harlem month by month, two things happened. First, a sheer physical pressure for room was set up that was irresistible. Second, old residents and newcomers got work as fast as they could take it, at wages never dreamed of. So there was now plenty of money for renting and buying. And the Negro in Harlem did, contrary to all the burlesque notions about what Negroes do when they get hold of money, take advantage of the low prices of property and begin to buy. Buying property became a contagious fever. It became a part of the gospel preached in the churches. It seems that generations of the experience of an extremely precarious foothold on the land of Manhattan Island flared up into a conscious determination never to let that condition return. So they turned the money from their newfound prosperity into property. All classes bought. It was not an unknown thing for a colored washerwoman to walk into a real estate office and lay down several thousand dollars on a house. There was Mrs. Mary Dean, known as Pigfoot Mary, because of her high reputation in the business of preparing and selling that particular delicacy, so popular in Harlem. She paid $42,000 for a five-story apartment house at the corner of 7th Avenue and 137th Street, which was sold later to a colored undertaker for $72,000. The Equitable Life Assurance Company held vacant for quite a while a block of 106 model private houses, designed by Stanford White, which the company had been obliged to take over following the Hajira of the Whites from Harlem. When they were put on the market, they were promptly bought by Negroes at an aggregate price of about $2 million. John E. Nail a colored real estate dealer of Harlem who is a member of the Real Estate Board of New York and an appraisal authority states that Negroes own and control Harlem real property worth at a conservative estimate between 50 and 60 million dollars. Relatively, these figures are amazing. Twenty years ago, barely a half dozen colored individuals owned land on Manhattan. Down to 15 years ago, the amount that Negroes had acquired in Harlem was by comparison negligible. Today, a very large part of property in Harlem occupied by Negroes is owned by Negroes. It should be noted that Harlem was taken over without violence. In some of the large northern cities where the same sort of expansion of the Negro population was going on, there was not only strong antagonism on the part of whites, but physical expression of it. In Chicago, Cleveland, and other cities, houses bought and moved into by Negroes were bombed. In Chicago, a church bought by a colored congregation was badly damaged by bombs. 
in other cities several formerly white churches which had been taken over by colored congregations were bombed in Detroit mobs undertook to evict Negroes from houses bought by them in white neighborhoods the mob drove vans up to one house just purchased and moved into by a colored physician ordered him out loaded all his goods into the vans and carted them back to his old residence these arrogated functions of the mob reached a climax in the celebrated sweet case a mob gathered in the evening round a house in a white neighborhood which dr. O. H. sweet a colored physician had bought and moved into the day before when the situation reached a critical point shots fired from within the house killed one person in the crowd and seriously wounded another dr. sweet his wife and eight others relatives and friends who were in the house at the time were indicted and tried for murder in the first degree they were defended in two long trials by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Through Clarence Darrow and Arthur Garfield Hayes, assisted by several local attorneys, and were acquitted. This was the tragic end of eviction by mob in Detroit. Although there was bitter feeling in Harlem during the 15 years of struggle, the Negro went through in getting a foothold on the land, there was never any demonstration of violence that could be called serious. Not since the riot of 1900 has New York witnessed, except for minor incidents, any interracial disturbances. Not even in the memorable summer of 1919, that summer when the stoutest hearted Negroes felt terror and dismay when the race got the worst backlash of the war and the Ku Klux Klan was in the ascendant when almost simultaneously there were riots in Chicago and in Longview Texas in Omaha and in Phillips County Arkansas and hundreds of Negroes chased through the streets or hunted down through the swamps were beaten and killed when in the national capital an anti-Negro mob held sway for three days in which time six persons were killed and scores severely beaten not even during this period of massacre did New York with more than a hundred thousand Negroes grouped together in Harlem lose its equanimity it is apparent that race friction as it affects Harlem as a community has grown less and less each year for the past ten years and the signs are that there will not be a recrudescence the signs are confirmed by certain basic conditions. Although Harlem is a Negro community, the newest comers do not long remain merely quote unquote Harlem Negroes. Astonishingly, they soon become New Yorkers. One reason for this is that by comparison with Chicago, Detroit, Pittsburgh, or Cleveland, there is no gang labor among Negroes in New York. The longshoremen are an exception but the Negro longshoremen are highly unionized and stand on an equal footing with their white fellow workers employment of Negroes in New York is diversified they are employed more as individuals than as non integral parts of a gang this gives them the opportunity for more intimate contacts with the life and spirit of the city as a whole a thousand Negroes from Mississippi brought up and put to work in a Pittsburgh plant will for a long time remain a thousand Negroes from Mississippi under the conditions that prevail in New York they would all inside of six months be pretty good New Yorkers one of the chief factors in the Chicago race riot in 1919 was the fact that at the time more than 12,000 Negroes were employed at the stockyards moreover there is the psychology of New York the natural psychology of a truly cosmopolitan city in which there is always the tendency to minimize rather than magnify distinctions of this sort in which such distinctions tend to die out unless kept alive by some intentional agency New York more than any other American city maintains a matter-of-fact a taken-for-granted attitude 
toward her Negro citizens. Less there than anyone else in the country are Negroes regarded as occupying a position of wardship. More nearly do they stand upon the footing of common and equal citizenship. It may be that one of the causes of New York's attitude lies in the fact that the Negro there has achieved a large degree of political independence, that he has broken away from a political creed based merely upon traditional and sentimental grounds. Yet, on the other hand, this itself may be a result of New York's attitude. At any rate, there is no longer any apparent feeling against the occupancy of Harlem by Negroes. Within the past five years, the colony has expanded to the South, the North, and the West. It has gone down 7th Avenue from 127th Street to Central Park at 110th Street. It has climbed upwards between 8th Avenue and the Harlem River from 145th Street to 155th. It has spread to the west and occupies the heights of Coogan's Bluff overlooking Colonial Park. And to the east and west of this solid Negro area there is a fringe where the population is mixed, white, and colored. This expansion of the past five years has taken place without any physical opposition or even any considerable outbreak of antagonistic public sentiment. The question inevitably arises, will the Negroes of Harlem be able to hold it? Will they not be driven still farther northward? Residents of Manhattan, regardless of race, have been driven out when they lay in the path of business and greatly increased land values. Harlem lies in the direction that path must take so there is little probability that Negroes will always hold it as a residential section. But this is to be considered. The Negroes' situation in Harlem is without precedent in all his history in New York. Never before has he been so securely anchored. Never before has he owned the land. Never before has he had so well established a community life. It is probable that land through the heart of Harlem will some day so increase in value that Negroes may not be able to hold it. Although it is quite as probable that there will be some Negroes able to take full advantage of the increased values and will be forced to make a move. But the next move when it comes will be unlike the others. It will not be a move made solely at the behest of someone else it will be more in the nature of a bargain. Nor will it be a move in which the Negro will carry with him only his household goods and utensils. He will move at a financial profit to himself. But at the present time, such a move is nowhere in sight. Chapter 14 Within the past ten years, Harlem has acquired a worldwide reputation. It has gained a place in the list of famous sections of great cities, it is known in Europe and the Orient, and it is talked about by natives in the interior of Africa. It is farthest known as being exotic, colorful, and sensuous, a place of laughing, singing, and dancing, a place where life wakes up at night. This phase of Harlem's fame is most widely known because, in addition to being spread by ordinary agencies, it has been proclaimed in story and song, and certainly this is Harlem's most striking and fascinating aspect. New Yorkers and people visiting New York from the world over go to the nightclubs of Harlem and dance to such jazz music as can be heard nowhere else, and they get an exhilaration impossible to duplicate. Some of these seekers after new sensations go beyond the gay nightclubs. They peep in under the more seamy side of things. They nose down into the lower strata of life. A visit to Harlem at night, the principal streets never deserted, gay crowds skipping from one place of amusement to another, lines of taxicabs and limousines standing under the sparkling lights of the entrances to the famous nightclubs, the subway kiosk swallowing and disgorging crowds all night long, gives the impression that Harlem never sleeps 
and that the inhabitants thereof jazz through existence. But of course, no one can seriously think that the 200,000 and more Negroes in Harlem spend their nights on any such pleasance. Of a necessity, the vast majority of them are ordinary hard-working people who spend their time in just about the same way that other ordinary hard-working people do. Most of them have never seen the inside of a nightclub. The great bulk of them are confronted with the stern necessity of making a living, of making both ends meet, or finding money to pay the rent and keep the children fed, and clothed neatly enough to attend school. Their waking hours are almost entirely consumed in this unromantic task, and it is a task in which they cannot escape running up against a barrier erected especially for them, a barrier which pens them off on the morass, no, the quicksands of economic insecurity. Fewer jobs are open to them than to any other group, and in such jobs as they get, they are subject to the old rule which still obtains, quote, the last to be hired and the first to be fired, end quote. Notwithstanding all that, gaiety is peculiarly characteristic of Harlem. The people who live there are by nature a pleasure-loving people, and though most of them must take their pleasures in a less expensive manner than in nightly visits to clubs, they nevertheless, as far as they can afford, and often much farther, do satisfy their hunger for enjoyment. And since they are constituted as they are, enjoyment being almost as essential to them as food, perhaps really a compensation which enables them to persist, it is well that they are able to extract pleasure easily and cheaply. An average group of Negroes can, in dancing to a good jazz band, achieve a delightful state of intoxication that for others would require nothing short of a certain per capita imbibition of synthetic gin. The masses of Harlem get a good deal of pleasure out of things far too simple for most other folks. In the evenings of summer and on Sundays they get lots of enjoyment out of strolling. Strolling is almost a lost art in New York at least in the manner in which it is so generally practiced in Harlem. Strolling in Harlem does not mean merely walking along Lenox or Upper 7th Avenue or 135th Street. It means that those streets are places for socializing. One puts on one's best clothes and fares forth to pass the time pleasantly with the friends and acquaintances and, most important of all, the strangers he is sure of meeting. One saunters along. He hails this one, exchanges a word or two with that one, stops for a short chat with the other one. He comes up to a laughing, chattering group, in which he may have only one friend or acquaintance, but that gives him the privilege of joining in. He does join in and takes part in the joking, the small talk and gossip, and makes new acquaintances. He passes on and arrives in front of one of the theaters, studies the bill for a while, undecided about going in. He finally moves on a few steps farther and joins another group and is introduced to two or three pretty girls who have just come to Harlem, perhaps only for a visit, and finds a reason to be glad that he postponed going into the theater. The hours of a summer evening run by rapidly. This is not simply going out for a walk. It is more like going out for an adventure. In almost as simple a fashion, the masses of Harlem get enjoyment out of church going. This enjoyment, however, is not quite so inexpensive as strolling can be made. Some critics of the Negro, especially Negro critics, say that religion cost him too much, that he has too many churches, and that many of them are magnificent beyond his means, that church mortgages and salaries and upkeep consume the greater part of the financial margin of the race and keep its economic nose to the grindstone all of which is in the main true. There are something like 160 colored churches in Harlem. A hundred of these could be closed 
and there will be left a sufficient number to supply the religious needs of the community. There will be left, in fact, just about the number of churches that are regularly organized and systematically administered, and that could be adequately supported. The superfluous 100 or more are ephemeral and nomadic, belonging to no one established denomination and within no classification. They are here today and gone somewhere else, or gone entirely tomorrow. They are housed in rented quarters, a store, the floor of a private dwelling, or even the large room of a flat, and remain as long as the rent can be met, or until a move is made, perhaps, to other quarters. Doubtless some of the founders of these excess churches are sincere, though ignorant, but it is certain that many of them are parasitical fakers, even downright scoundrels, who count themselves successful when they have under the guise of religion got enough hard-working women together to ensure them an easy living. This little church movement has also given rise to many cults and much occultism. Ira D. A. Reed of the National Urban League recently made a survey of the churches of Harlem and found that there had been a rapid growth in the number of religious sects that studied and practiced esoteric mysteries. In his report he says, quote, There are they who dabble in spiritualism, exhibiting their many charms and wares in the form of grand imperial incense, prayer incense, aluminum trumpets, luminous bands, and other accessories. End quote. Among these cults, some of the names found by Mr. Reed were the Commandment Keepers, Holy Church of the Living God, the Pillar and Ground of Truth, the Temple of the Gospel of the Kingdom, the Metaphysical Church of the Divine Investigation, Prophet Bess, St. Matthew's Church of the Divine Silence and Truth, Tabernacle of the Congregation of the Disciples of the Kingdom, the Church of the Temple of Love, Taking the situation as a whole, there is truly a wide margin of money, effort, and energy that could be saved or more effectively spent by cutting out all extravagances in the needed churches, cutting off the waste brought about by the needless churches, and abolishing entirely the bootleggers of religion. The multiplicity of churches in Harlem and in every other Negro community is commonly accounted for by the innate and deep religious emotion of the race. Conceding the strength and depth of this emotion, there is also the vital fact that colored churches provide their members with a great deal of enjoyment, aside from the joys of religion. Indeed, a Negro church is for its members much more besides a place of worship. It is a social center. It is a club. It is an arena for the exercise of one's capabilities and powers, a world in which one may achieve self-realization and preferment. Of course, a church means something of the same sort to all groups. But with the Negro, all these attributes are magnified because of the fact that they are so curtailed for him in the world at large. Most of the large Harlem churches open early on Sunday morning and remain open until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And there is not an hour during that time when any one of them is empty. A good many people stay in church all day. There they take their dinner, cooked and served hot by a special committee. Aside from any spiritual benefits derived, going to church means being dressed in one's best clothes forgetting for the time about work, having the chance to acquit oneself with credit before one's fellows, and having the opportunity of meeting, talking, and laughing with friends, and of casting and appraising and approving eye upon the opposite sex. Going to church is an outlet for the Negro's religious emotions, but not the least reason why he is willing to support so many churches is that they furnish so many agreeable activities and so much real enjoyment. He is willing to support them because he has not yet and will not have until there is far greater economic and intellectual development and social organization 
any other agencies that can fill their place. The importance of the place of the church in Negro life is not comparable with its importance among other American groups. In a community like Harlem, which has not yet attained cohesion and adjustment, the church is a stabilizing force. The integrating value of the churches in Harlem, where there are so many disintegrating forces at work, can easily be underestimated. This is especially true of churches like Mother Zion, St. Philip's, and Abyssinian, each of which is an organization with over a hundred years of continuous historical background. The severest critic of the shortcomings of the Negro church would pause before wishing a Harlem without churches. What intelligent criticism should at present insist upon is that the Negro church live more fully up to the responsibilities and opportunities which it has over and above those of the churches of other groups, that it throw out moss-backed theology and obsolete dogmatics, and strive to make itself a greater force in bettering the Negro state in this world and in this country, that it seek to give out larger and larger essential values in return for the millions of dollars the Negro masses pour into its coffers. There is not now any other piece of organization machinery that could do these things as well as the Negro church could do them. In so doing, the church would not limit but would extend its spiritual forces. Much higher spiritual returns could be gained by explanations to the masses of the economic factors involved in the condition of the race than by inane fulminations against dancing and theater going. Some ministers meet criticism of this sort by asking the critics why they do not complain as loudly about the money that Negroes spend in places of amusement as they do about the money Negroes give to the church. That is a sound question as far as it goes, but it does not go all the way. No one who spends money in a cabaret, for instance, has any right to demand of the proprietor of the place what use he proposes to make of that money. On the other hand, the church is a corporate membership institution, and those who give to its support have every right to ask about the administration of its resources. But outside criticism, however intelligent, won't go very far toward changing things. It is possible for it to have just the opposite effect. The change must be wrought from within. And it may be that there will rise up out of the element of colored clergy which realizes the potentialities of a modern Negro church, a man with sufficient wisdom and power to bring about a new reformation. In Harlem, as in all American Negro communities, the fraternal bodies also fill an important place. These fraternities, too, are in a very large degree social organizations, but they have also an economic feature. In addition to providing the enjoyment of large meetings, large balls and picnics, and the interest and excitement of large politics, there are provisions for taking care of the sick and burying the dead. Both of these latter provisions are highly commendable and are the means of attracting a good many members. However, the criticism can be made that very often the amount of money spent for burying the dead is out of proportion to that spent in caring for the living. Indeed, this is so general that it makes, quote-unquote, the high cost of dying a live question among Negroes. Harlem is also a parade ground. During the warmer months of the year, no Sunday passes without several parades. There are brass bands, marchers in resplendent regalia, and high dignitaries, with gorgeous insignia riding in automobiles. Almost any excuse for parading is sufficient. The funeral of a member of the lodge, the laying of a cornerstone, the annual sermon to the order, or just a general desire to turn out. Parades are not limited to Sundays, for when the funeral of a lodge member falls on a weekday, it is quite the usual thing to hold the exercises at night, so that members of the order and friends who are at work during the day may attend. Frequently, after nightfall, a slow procession 
may be seen wending its way along and a band heard playing a dirge that takes on a deeply sepulchral tone. But generally these parades are lively and add greatly to the movement, color, and gaiety of Harlem. A brilliant parade with very good bands is participated in not only by the marchers in line but also by the marchers on the sidewalks. For it is not a universal custom of Harlem to stand idly and watch a parade go by. A good part of the crowd always marches along keeping step to the music. Now it would be entirely misleading to create the impression that all Harlem indulges in none other than these Arcadian like pleasures. There is a large element of educated well to do metropolitans among the Negroes of Harlem who view with indulgence often with something less the responses of the masses to these artless amusements. There is the solid respectable bourgeois class of the average proportion whose counterpart is to be found in every southern city. There are strictly social sets that go in for bridge parties, breakfast parties, cocktail parties, for high-powered cars, weekends, and exclusive dances. Occasionally, an exclusive dance is held in one of the ballrooms of a big downtown hotel. Harlem has its sophisticated, fast sets, initiates in all the wisdom of worldliness, and Harlem has, too, its underworld, its world of pimps and prostitutes, of gamblers and thieves, of illicit love and illicit liquor, of red sins and dark crimes. In a word, Harlem possesses in some degree all of the elements of a cosmopolitan center. And by that same word, striking an average, we find that the overwhelming majority of its people are people whose counterparts may be found in any American community. Yet, as a whole community, it possesses a sense of humor and a love of gaiety that are distinctly characteristic. Chapter 15 During the term of exile of the Negro from the downtown theaters of New York, which began in 1910 and lasted for seven lean years, there grew up in Harlem a real Negro theater, something New York had never had before. That is, a theater in which Negro performers played to audiences made up almost wholly of people of their own race. In several southern cities, there had been for a decade or more theaters where the audiences, on account of the laws separating the races in places of amusement, were strictly colored. And in Chicago, there was the Pekin Theater, a Negro theater patronized principally by colored people. But the professional experience of Negro performers in New York had always been to play before audiences predominantly white. The rise of a Negro theater in Harlem was therefore a new thing, and because it was within the radius of the circle in which the theatrical forces of the country are centered, it proved to be a very important thing. It is not an exaggeration to say that it worked some vital changes. The Negro performer in New York, who had always been playing to white or predominantly white audiences, found himself in an entirely different psychological atmosphere. He found himself freed from a great many restraints and taboos that had cramped him for 40 years. In all those years, he had been constrained to do a good many things that were distasteful because managers felt they were things that would please white folks. Likewise, he was forbidden to do some other things because managers feared they would displease white folks. One of the well-known taboos was that there should never be any romantic lovemaking in a Negro play. If anything approaching a love duet was introduced in a musical comedy, it had to be broadly burlesqued. The reason behind this taboo lay in the belief that a love scene between two Negroes could not strike a white audience except as ridiculous. The taboo existed in deference to the superiority stereotype that Negroes cannot be supposed to mate romantically. But 
do so in some sort of minstrel fashion or in some more primeval manner than white people. This taboo had been one of the most strictly observed. In the middle theatrical period, Cole and Johnson had come nearest to breaking it in their shoe fly regiment and Red Moon. Williams and Walker never seriously attempted to do so. So, with the establishment of the Negro Theater in Harlem, colored performers in New York experienced, for the first time, release from the restraining fears of what a white audience would stand for. For the first time, they felt free to do on the stage whatever they were able to do. This sense of freedom manifested itself in efforts covering a wide range, efforts that ran all the way from crude Negro burlesque to Broadway drama. This intermediate and experimental theatrical period developed mainly in two Harlem theaters, the Lafayette and the Lincoln. Within several years, both these houses had good stock companies, and for quite a while, their repertoires consisted chiefly of downtown success. The Lafayette players developed into a very proficient organization that gave adequate presentations of Madame X, the servant in the house, on trial, the love of Chu Chin, within the law, and other such plays. These melodramatic plays made a great appeal to Harlem audiences. To most of the people that crowded the Lafayette and the Lincoln, the thrill received from these pieces was an entirely new experience, and it was all the closer and more moving because it was expressed in terms of their own race. For a time, Negro sketches and musical shows were swept off the stage, but they are now back again. The two stock companies had as members some performers who came down from the days of the Isham, Williams and Walker, Cole and Johnson shows, and they also developed a number of young dramatic actors who became great Harlem favorites. There were Anita Bush, Inez Clue, Abby Mitchell, Ida Anderson, Evelyn Ellis, Lottie Grady, Laura Bauman, Susie Sutton, Cleo Desmond, Edna Thomas, Charles Gilpin, Frank Wilson, Tom Brown, Charles Moore, Sidney Kirkpatrick, Lionel Monagas, A.B. Tomathieri, Walter Thompson, Babe Townsend, Charles Olden, Andrew Bishop, Clarence Muse, Jack Carter. All of these names were as well known to Harlem as those of Broadway favorites to the rest of the city. Readers who are at all familiar with the present period of the Negro in the theater will see that in this list there are those who did not remain limited to Harlem or to the circuit played by the Harlem stock companies, but helped to place the Negro fairly and squarely on Broadway. The Negro theater in Harlem, in which the colored performer gained a new freedom and new incentives, proved to be the exact medium he needed through which to fit himself for the fresh start he was to make. All through this intermediate period, there were times when polite comedy and high-tension melodrama gave way to blackface farce, hilarious musical comedy, and bills of specialties. The black Harlem audiences enjoyed being thrilled, but they also wanted to laugh, and a Negro audience seems never to laugh heartier than when laughing at itself, provided it is a strictly Negro audience. There were several Negro producers who kept the older tradition alive. The Tut Brothers, Whitney and J. Homer, Irving C. Miller, and S. H. Dudley. Their productions always drew good houses, but in this field there stands out above them all a musical show produced at the Lafayette Theater in 1913 which not only played to great local crowds, but brought Broadway up to Harlem. The piece was Dark Town Follies, written and staged by Labrie Hill, formerly a member of the Williams and Walker Company. Dark Town Follies drew space, headlines, and cartoons in the New York papers, and consequently it became 
the Vogue to go to Harlem to see it. This was the beginning of the nightly migration to Harlem in search of entertainment. One visitor to the Darktown Follies was Florenz Ziegfeld, and a very much interested visitor he was. He bought the rights to produce the finale to the first act and several song numbers in his own Follies. The finale to the first act of Darktown Follies was one of those miracles of originality which occasionally come to pass in the world of musical comedy. Its title was, quote unquote, At the Ball. The tune was the sort of melody that, once heard, is unforgettable, and words and music were combined into a very clever piece of syncopation. But it was the staging that made it so striking. The whole company formed an endless chain that passed before the footlights and behind the scenes, round and round, singing and executing a movement from a dance called Ball in the Jack. One of those Negro dances which periodically come along and sweep the country. This finale was one of the greatest hits the Ziegfeld Follies ever had. One of the song numbers Mr. Ziegfeld took was, quote, Rock Me in the Cradle of Love, which in the Darktown Follies had been sung by the Negro tenor to the bronze soubrette in a most impassioned manner, demonstrating that the love-making taboo had been absolutely kicked out of the Negro theater. In 1915, Edward Sterling Wright came to the Lafayette Theater with a very creditable presentation of Othello. This period in Harlem filled in the gap between the second and third periods of the Negro and the theater. The third period is now in full swing, and the Negro theater in Harlem is also very much alive. At present, aside from the picture houses, there are three large Negro theaters in Harlem. The third was added when several years ago the Alhambra Theater on 7th Avenue near 125th Street, long a Keith Vaudeville house, was converted into a theater for performances given by and for Negroes. April 5, 1917 is the date of the most important single event in the entire history of the Negro in the American theater for it marks the beginning of a new era. On that date, a performance of three dramatic plays was given by the colored players at the Garden Theater in Madison Square Garden, New York, and the stereotyped traditions regarding the Negroes' histrionic limitations were smashed. It was the first time anywhere in the United States for Negro actors in the dramatic theater to command the serious attention of the critics and of the general press and public. The plays were three one-act plays written by Ridgely Torrance. They were produced by Mrs. Emily Hapgood. The settings and costumes were designed by Robert Edmund Jones and the staging was under his direction. The acting was fine. In several of the roles it was superb. In fact, nothing that has been done since has afforded Negro performers such a wide gamut for their powers. The praise of the critics was enthusiastic and practically unanimous. The performance opened with The Rider of Dreams, a play of rustic Negro life, and a true comedy. The second play was Granny Mommy, a tragedy of the color line which contained a vivid scene of voodoo enchantment. The play that closed the performance was Simon the Cyrenian, which was billed as a quote-unquote passion interlude. It was the story of Simon, the black man who was Jesus' cross-bearer. These plays, a rustic comedy, a voodoo tragedy, and the passion interlude made a high demand on the versatility of the company. The first called for humorous characterization, the second for dramatic power, and the third for finished acting. The demand was fully measured up to. 
George Jean Nathan in making his estimate of the 10 most distinguished performers of the year gave Opal Cooper for his work in The Ride of Dreams 7th place in the list of male actors and Inez Clu for her portrayal of Procula, the wife of Pilate, in Simon the Cyrenian, ninth place among the women. A glance at the cast of these plays will show some names that have by now become a bit familiar to the reader, and will also buttress the statement made earlier in this book that the accumulation of theatrical training and stage technique has made possible the higher development of each period of the Negro in the theater over the period preceding. This knocks something of a hole in the popular idea that Negroes, because of their marked aptitude for the theater, simply walk out on the stage and act. In certain exceptional cases they do, but generally they do not. We see the name of Jesse Ship. Mr. Ship's professional experience goes back to the minstrel period with Primrose and West's quote 40 whites and 30 blacks and comes down through the Isham, the Cole and Johnson and the Williams and Walker shows. At the present time Mr. Ship is playing a part in the Green Pastures. Alex Rogers came down through the Williams and Walker shows. Mrs. Clue came down through the Isham and the Cole and Johnson shows and the Lafayette players. Miss Dees came through the Cole and Johnson shows. In addition to Miss Clue, the Lafayette players were represented by Andrew Bishop and Lottie Grady. One of those special exceptions was old pal Cooper. Mr. Cooper had never been on the professional stage before. His sole previous preparation was what he had gained as an entertainer in a nightclub. John T. Butler who played the role of Simon, was a post office employee and had acquired his experience in amateur and semi-professional theatricals. Mary Jackson Stewart had long been a dramatic reader. A notable feature of the production was the singing orchestra under the direction of J. Rosamond Johnson. A singing orchestra as part of a play was at the time a distinct innovation in the theater in New York. The colored players remained 10 days at the Garden Theater, then moved up to the Garrick with every promise of success. But the fates planned otherwise. The colored players opened on April 5, 1917, and on the following day, April 6, the United States declared war against the Imperial German government. They played at the Garrick for several weeks but the increasing stress of the war was too great even for stronger enterprises in the theater and it crushed them out. Nevertheless this effort marked the beginning of the third and present period of the Negro in the American theater and it was Emily Hapgood who has recently died who first demonstrated the faith that the Negro could make a place on the legitimate stage. After the close of the war the effort was carried forward in addition to the theater in Harlem, there has been another medium through which significant effect has been wrought on the Negro in the theater. That medium is the nightclubs. Too many, especially among colored people, a Harlem nightclub is a den of iniquity, where the devil holds high revel. The fact is that the average nightclub is as orderly as many a Sunday school picnic has been. These clubs are patronized by many quite respectable citizens. Anyone who visits them expecting to be shocked is likely to be disappointed. Generally, nightclubbers go simply to have a good time. They laugh and talk and they dance to the most exhilarating music. And they watch a first-rate review. Certainly, there are infractions of the Volstead Act but they also take place in the best regulated homes. The larger clubs maintain permanent companies of performers in such clubs as Connie's Inn, The Cotton Club, and Small's Paradise put on reviews that are often better 
than what may be seen in the theaters downtown. The nightclubs have been the training ground for a good part of the talent that has been drawn upon by musical comedy and reviews in the professional theater. And not only for strictly Negro productions, but also for productions in which there have been mixed cast, as for example in Showboat and Golden Dawn. The nightclubs also constitute the stage for a number of crack Negro bands. Duke Ellington's is one of the most famous jazz bands in the country. Fletcher Henderson's is another, which however generally plays in a downtown club. There are hundreds of musicians and hundreds of performers connected with the nightclubs of Harlem. The waiters, cooks, coat room girls, doormen, and others make up several more hundreds. It has been estimated that there are something like 2,000 Negroes employed in these clubs. The Little Theater movement has also been started and restarted in Harlem, as the various efforts for establishment flourished and died. There have been three or four definite and partially successful efforts. The most successful was made by the Krigwa Players, organized by W. E. Burghardt Du Bois in connection with the literary and artistic program of the Crisis magazine. The Krigwa Players had the distinction of winning a place in the Little Theater Tournament 1927 to compete for the David Belasco Trophy. The company did not win the trophy, but its play, The Fool's Errand, written by Eulalie Spence, a New York colored girl, was awarded one of the Samuel French Prizes for the best unpublished manuscript plays in the country.